Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The Word of God that I'd like to study with you this morning is the Old Testament reading from Isaiah chapter 65. Probably not that familiar, so I'd invite you to take out your worship folder and follow along there. What's the longest you've been away from home? And can you remember what it felt like to finally go home? Maybe you were on a vacation, an extended vacation, and maybe you absolutely loved your time away from home, whether that was the place that you went to or the activities that you did or the people that you saw. But there finally came a time where like, okay, I just want my own bed, and I want my own pillow, and maybe if you left kids behind for a little while, you actually started missing them too. Or, or maybe you had a long hospital stay, or you even had to go to a nursing home for a rehab, and, and you understood that they just wanted to get you healthy, they wanted to get your strength back, so that when you, you finally did get to go home, you would be safe, but, but you just wanted to be home. Maybe some of you have even been deployed. I, I can't even imagine what it would be like to be thousands of miles away, even across an ocean, for months, even years. Counting the days, anticipating your homecoming. Well, today through the prophet Isaiah, God gives us a description of our true and eternal home. As we hear about heaven today, God encourages us to anticipate our final homecoming. A little background. Isaiah is preaching about 700 years before <coughs> Jesus is born. And he's preaching to the people of Judah, and that's the southern kingdom of Israel, after it had split. And the people of Judah, by and large, had forgotten all about God. You know, they were busy. They had jobs. They had family. They had friends. They had other things to do. And, and even when God sent his prophets like Isaiah and others, they, they didn't really want to hear it. They weren't listening to God. They weren't paying any attention to his word. And In fact, they were provoking God. Because they had begun to worship other gods, the false gods of the people who lived around them. They were offering sacrifices that God did not request in places that he did not command. And when it comes right down to it, they were just plain and simply living for themselves. Now Isaiah has, I think, more prophecies about the coming Messiah than any other prophet. And yet, even after all of those prophecies, as you get very near the end of Isaiah's book, God has this warning for his people. Now this is before your text. He says, As for you who forsake the Lord and those who forget my holy mountain, I will destine you for the sword. All of you will fall in the slaughter. For I called, but you did not answer. I spoke, but you did not listen. You did evil in my sight and chose what displeases me. Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. You will go hungry, you will go thirsty, you will be put to shame, you will cry out from anguish of heart and wail in brokenness of spirit. You will leave your name for people to use in their curses. Now, that's quite a message. That was over a hundred years before God sent destruction to the people of Judah. King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian army marched in and they wiped out, I mean, they completely destroyed the capital city of Jerusalem. And they carried all of the people of Judah off to the foreign land of Babylon where God said they would live for 70 years. Now that's about a lifetime, right? That means that the middle aged and older people, they would die there. It means that many of the people who were born in the early years of the captivity would never get to go back to their original homeland. It means that the generation that finally would return would have never even lived there. And yet, God holds out hope. And in the verses before us today, God reminds his people that he always preserves for himself a remnant and that there would come a time when they would finally get to go. Well, in that picture that we have before us today, there's a message for us too. 
Okay? And the first thing is to remember that this world in which we live is a land of captivity. I mean, originally, God intended that his people would live on this earth with him forever. But as soon as Adam and Eve sinned, and they brought sin and its destruction into this world, and the world became sin-broken and sin-tainted, this is no longer our home. Like maybe you remember, God put the angel of cherubim and the flaming swords in front of the Garden of Eden so that Adam and Eve could not get to the Tree of Life and, and be stuck in this sin-tainted world forever. But we do deserve to stay here, or worse, because we're like the people of Judah. And how often don't we kind of forget about God because we've got work to do, and we've got school, and we've got activities, and all this other stuff that we talk about all the time. How often don't we fail to listen to God? You know, as long as I've got opportunity, then maybe I'll listen. But if there's something else, maybe not. How often don't we sacrifice to the false gods around us? And I know that you've probably never brought an animal to a hill and offered it to the god of Baal. Uh, but how much money and time and energy don't we spend on our leisure and our kids and on all the things of this world, often forgetting about God until we need him? And yet God reminds us that he always preserves for himself a remnant. And that he promises to give us a new home. That we all know about the promises of Isaiah that were already fulfilled in Christ. That the virgin will be with child, and to us a son is born, to us a son is given, and, and he was crushed for our iniquities, and, and the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We know that Jesus came and lived a perfect life, and died on the cross to take away all of our sins, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, and now we are just waiting. We are just waiting for him to come back and take us to be with him. And isn't that what he promised on Monday, Thursday? He said, in my Father's house are many rooms, and I'm going there to prepare a place for you, and I will come back and take you to be with me, so that you also may be where I am. And today he gives us a description of that home. Now you can take a look at the verses in your bulletin. And he says, see, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. God's going to create a brand new world to be your home. I wonder what you would consider to be the happiest place on earth. Andrew will tell you it's Disney, because he likes to visit Mickey Mouse. Maybe you've been to Mexico. Heather and I might agree that that's better than Disney. Maybe you've been to Hawaii, and you would argue with me that Hawaii is the most beautiful place. Or maybe you would say it's wherever you can find your family and friends. Whatever you consider to be the happiest place on earth, God says that the new heaven and the new earth, it's going to be even better. And do you know why? It's not going to be because Mickey Mouse is there or because of the beautiful oceans or the mountains or the food or the thrilling rides or even the family. Heaven is going to be the best home you could ever want because God is going to be there. His light and His life and His glory will so fill the place that once we experience it, we won't want to be anywhere else. In fact, Isaiah says, or God says through Isaiah, that we won't even remember the former things. That could be a little disappointing if we think, well, won't I remember getting married or the birth of my child or there's other events in life? I don't know. But I do know that we won't remember the struggle, the suffering, the sin. 
And God already tells us that because Jesus died for us, he remembers our sin no more. You know, we tend to replay those things over and over and over again. And the devil tries to use our past sins to load on the guilt. But but God says, just forget about it. I've already taken that sin away. Don't give it a second thought because he doesn't. And so also... Our marriage struggles, our parenting struggles, the time we lost our job, all the times we weren't sure if we would be able to pay the bills, the time that someone got sick, the time that we lost a loved one much earlier than we would have preferred. God says that we will remember none of that suffering, none of that tragedy, none of that consequence of sin. Instead, he says that we will rejoice and be glad forever in his glory and his presence. In fact, God says that even in verse 19, he will rejoice over Jerusalem and he will take delight in his people. God already takes delight in you. Maybe it's like when when you are filled with pride over your children or your grandchildren. Maybe they they make a basket or they score a goal or or they they sing a beautiful tune in the in the play or or some accomplishment or or maybe some kind of a, a personal gift and it just fills your heart. You take delight in your child. God already takes delight in you. And we know he shouldn't. There's no reason that he should delight in me. But because of Christ, he does. Even more so in heaven. And then he says the opposite, the sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. If we don't remember the sin and the suffering and the struggle of the life gone, and if there is no sin in heaven, there will never again be anything that gives us even a hint of sadness. Pure joy, pure delight. That is the home that is waiting for you. Now in the next verse, God says, you will live there forever. Never again will there be in this home an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at a hundred will be just a mere child, and the one who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. And we know that in heaven there is no death. But the point is, we will live forever. Forever young. Can you imagine? Now what do you think was your prime age? You know, back when you were... 23, and you were healthy, and you were strong, and you were active, and and you could do all of the things that you want, forever young, no more sore knees, no more sore backs, no more sore shoulders, no more problems seeing close up or far away, no more need for surgery, no more flu, no more cold, no more sickness, no more cancer, no more MS, no more rheumatoid arthritis, no more of those stupid commercials that want you to talk to your doctor about this pill, that pill, or the other pill. And best yet, no more bills to pay the doctor for doing nothing because you're still sick. It's all gone. Forever young. Well, but what are we going to do? People often ask, what what are we going to do in heaven? I think people are afraid that we're just going to sing hymns forever. And they think, well, I don't mind singing hymns for a little while, but I'm not sure I want to be in an eternal choir. Well, I don't know. The Bible doesn't specifically say, but the the very next verse gives me the impression that there will be work to do. And I always think back to, to the beginning of creation when God created the earth. And before sin entered, God gave Adam and Eve work to do. Remember? God told them to take care of the garden and the world that he had created. Well, talking to the people of Judah... Isaiah says that they will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them or plant and others eat. But rather, my chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands. Now, Isaiah is talking to people who 100 years down the road, actually 170 then, would come back and they would get to live in their own houses rather than in, in somebody else's house. They would get to work in their own yards rather than take care of somebody else's. I I don't know exactly what that's going to be like in heaven, but I think that we might have work to do. The difference is, it won't be hard. 
It won't be laborious. It won't make us tired. It won't be some, we won't work just because we have bills to pay. We won't work because we have to put food on the table or a roof over our head or clothes on our back. We'll work simply for the joy and satisfaction of doing the work that God has given us to do. Okay. Well, who's going to be there? And will we, will we know each other? That's another one of those questions the Bible doesn't exactly clarify. Now, I don't know why we wouldn't know one another. But what God emphasizes is not our relationship with one another, but rather our relationship with him. In, in fact, Jesus talked about that a little bit in the gospel reading. The Sadducees did not believe that there was a resurrection from the dead. So they come up with this nonsensical story about a woman who marries seven men. And, well, oh, Jesus, at the resurrection, whose husband will she be? Jesus says, in heaven, there is no more marrying or giving in marriage. Now, Heather doesn't think that's very romantic. She, she wants to be my wife forever. She's off the hook. No, we won't be husband and wife. I won't be Andrew and Eliana's dad anymore. Our human relationships, our earthly relationships will change. I think it will be more like when our children grow up to be adults, and we're not necessarily peers because on earth we still respect our elders, but we will become brothers and sisters in Christ, and we will be, the Bible describes that we will be the bride, the, the church is the bride, and Jesus is the groom, and God is our heavenly father still. In fact, in verse 24, what happens now will continue. God says, before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. And if you back up, he says, they will be a people blessed by the Lord, they and their descendants with them. Now, I have to tell you, not everyone that you know and love will be in heaven. Let that sink in. Because right now is the opportunity to tell the people that you know and love that you want them to be in heaven. And I, I know that today as we celebrate Saints Triumphant and we, we remember those who have gone to heaven this past year, there, there's a sense of grief and sadness because we're still missing them. And maybe it's been a number of years. My mom died 19 years ago and I still miss her. But here's what God tells us. Blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. All of the people that you love who die with faith in Christ, they have finally reached the goal, right? My mom's goal was not to live on earth until I got married and had kids and had her do all of my babysitting for me. My mom's goal was to get to heaven. She got there. My dad's goal was to get to heaven. He made it. He is with Jesus in saints triumphant. He's already living the dream. He's already home. Now we want to be there too. But don't miss the fact that we want to be with God and we will thank God for all of those who are with us. Because God will continue to provide for all of our needs. Jesus will continue to be our shepherd who spreads his tent over us so that never again will we hunger, never again will we thirst, never again will the sun beat down upon us, never again will we suffer. But God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Isn't that what we're waiting for? Aren't we all anticipating the day when we will finally get to go home to heaven? What do we do between now and then? We gather together as the family of God every week so that God can speak to us. We listen to God remind us about His Son and the forgiveness of sins He has already given us. We gather together so that we can read every single word in this book. I know it seems a little intimidating, but God wants us to learn everything here because it's all preparation for the day when we will spend eternity with Him. And so we study together, we gather together around God's word in our homes, and we ask the Holy Spirit to continue to fill our hearts with faith so that we can just hold on until that day when Jesus comes back. Anticipate 
your homecoming. Because whether Jesus comes just for you or if he comes for all of us, that day will be the best day of the rest of your life.